The sound stopped, and he was suddenly afraid. A chill passed over him, as if he had been notified that death was approaching. He wanted to question himself, calmly and deliberately, to ask whether it had been the sound of the wind, the sound of the sea, or a sound in his ears. But he had heard no such sound, he was sure. He had heard the mountain. Hey, this is Nick. This is David. This is Nathan. And on this episode of the Boss Podcast, we are discussing Yasunari Kawabata's The Sound of the Mountain. Yeah, so this novel, first published in Japan in 1954, is built by the steady accumulation of episodes in the domestic life of its aging protagonist, Shingo Ogata. And I'm going to ask you, Nathan, just to kind of give our listeners here a sort of idea of who exactly is a part of this family, maybe how they come together and we can kind of jump into why this is the central, thinly built plot of the novel. Sure. Um, so like you said, it's kind of built around this domestic life of this family, Shingo being the old sort of paternal figure, and his wife, Yasuko, and their children, Shuichi, the son, and Fusako, uh, the daughter, and Shuichi's uh, wife, Kikuko, who lives with the family. We quickly realize in the novel that things are not totally uh, good between all of these characters and the family's not the the ideal Japanese household that maybe uh, Shingo would hope that it would be. And this kind of forms the the beginning of this unraveling drama, uh, this, this family drama. Um, so, well, it's interesting the way that it unfolds because nothing's really clear at the beginning. And rather than continuing to just describe this let's let's get into some of these topics so nick do you want to just jump in and talk about how kawabata starts to un- unravel this uh this drama yeah so there's sort of like a slowly moving uh release of details throughout this novel and he sort of moves forward and back in time and across multiple seasons and you start to see that the independent marriages of his children are both sort of in shambles for different reasons so you have you have Suichi, who is uh, openly cheating on his wife and has a mistress. And then you have his daughter, who, uh, through an arranged marriage, was essentially married off to a, uh, I believe he's a drug dealer, miscreant, uh, all-around not impressive guy. And so both of them are dealing with that. And there's a, a quote that's sort of repeated multiple times through the novel, which is, do parents have to be responsible forever for their, chil- for their children's marriages? And so you just have Shingo dealing with uh, just looking at basically his legacy and, you know, the mess that it is. And when he tries to figure that out and then also look at his own marriage, you just have multiple layers of of generations of uh, pretty much failure. And so that sort of lays the foundation for uh, kind of just this slow, brooding, fairly apathetic, fairly kind of anger, anger filled uh, novel that Kawabata has lied, laid out for us. It's interesting that you think it's anger-filled. I, I, apathetic, I can see. And I, I suppose there is anger to it, but really it feels very defeatist. I guess maybe that's where the anger is, is in this sort of surrender. I feel like Shingo, from his perspective, he he's very... It was hard to figure out what he feels about things, actually for me other than the way he feels towards kikuko his daughter-in-law who he is very fond of but his relationship with his wife is kind of apathetic his relationship to his son is kind of it's defeatist he's like well i can't really fix it now but he tries anyway yeah and his relationship with his daughter is kind of downright animosity yeah i I hear your question about is it really anger and I actually do think it's anger, okay. and I just think the way it's expressed is very, it's very muted, and I don't know if that's a cultural thing or a specific representation of the character itself, but, you know, he's, he basically has this tension with his wife, and, you know, there's, there's the, some layer of, of uh, physical violence when she's snoring that she, he yeah. kind of smacks her um, just to her. try and, yeah, and, and closes her nose and, and, and things of that nature. And then there's, uh, you know, his relationship with, with his uh, offspring and his son especially. And there's just lots of tension there. And I, I, think, I think the way that anger comes out is a little bit different 
um, because he's still he's still playing with the idea of what could have been or rather what should have been or maybe even it never had a possibility to be there but what he thought he had been sold on sort of this tra- traditional domestic Japanese life and it's and it's really just a total mess and I think he does have anger over that and and apathy is definitely something I feel too but I think he just feels like he he screwed up or rather maybe he never even had the cards to succeed in the first place yeah there, there's that idea of it kind of comes to a head on the New Year's dinner where the son Shuichi says that he's been thinking a lot about whether his father can be considered a success or a failure. And uh, Shingo himself describes his life as an ordinary, mediocre life that's come as far as it has, and now it runs into good food at New Year's. And to me, that little line sort of captures how he sort of views his own existence. And uh, there is anger there, that's true, but... It is a it's it's a kind of sad sack sort of anger at his own existence. Um, I have a hard time thinking of Shingo's angry because I feel like if 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 I had thought that he was angry, I would have more respect for him. He just seems so defeated, and his anger or his will to change anything is so suppressed. Yeah, I go back and forth on whether he's truly not trying to change anything or if the ways that he's trying to change things are just so ineffective that it feels like nothing but you know i i would sort of argue that he's you know when looking at shuichi's marriage and uh, his mistress and he himself inserting uh into that dynamic and trying to fix things you know i i sort of view that as a step forward and and some level of action uh now whether or not it's successful, you can you can argue both ways. There's there's definitely a, the arc of the novel sort of leads you to believe that you know at at the point of where things are the worst is actually when things sort of achieve the best. And there's a quote for this that I really liked uh, towards the end of the novel, which is Suichi's marital relations had ripened since he had taken a mistress. Since Kakuko had had her abortion, they had softened, warmed. On the night of that wild storm, Kakuko had been much more coquettish towards Suichi than usual. On the night he had come home drunk, she had forgiven him more than usual. And so when I think of whether Shingo has action or inaction, I think he's definitely trying to insert him in this. And when the other characters in the novel really bottom out, you could argue that things start to clean up towards the end and actually have a positive trajectory. But he doesn't himself really have much to do with that one way or the other and I think I think I kind of side with Nathan a little more on that because even his wife kind of gets on his case about not doing anything over and over she she sort of nags him saying you know your daughter is here without her husband your your son is having an affair or whatever it is and still you just sit there and you talk about you know what kind of what the tree is doing in the backyard you're not actually doing anything I think throughout the novel, too, he's looking for ways to place the responsibility on somebody else. He's like, well, maybe maybe not doing anything would be the best thing to do. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe this will just like work itself out. Is that the way it works? Maybe it'll work itself out. And then if things just get worse and worse. He's like, okay, fine, I'll try to do something. And then he tries as quickly as possible to convince himself that it's fixed. And I think he's delusional. Well, I think some of that is part of how his own life was shaped, you know, like he had someone that he wanted, which was his wife's sister, but she died. And so to him, he just, the next best thing was like, I guess I'll just marry the sister is kind of how But it, she was already married anyway. Yeah. Well, I think it was, it was mentioned that they were a couple, I believe. Right. Or they were, I don't think going so. To be no, I don't think so. Okay. I think he was totally delusional. Like that was a way of explaining to himself his own failed marriage was that he wanted someone else, but he couldn't have had her. She was already married. It's like it's it's not a failed love. It's just complete delusion. Yes, it's fantasy for something that is absolutely impossible. Yeah, and so so my argument here is not that not that he put a bunch of stuff into motion and was a great success, and then there was just all this shit around him that that weighed him down. But that he is trying, but it's really, it's flailing. 
And I think there are things, I mean, let, let's be honest, he did go to the mistress's house of his son to try to put a stop to things and put himself into a fairly awkward scenario and all of that stuff. And you're right, I don't know if that actually helped or didn't help, but I think it I think it was And then she told him to go away. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right. And he only went after he found out that this woman was pregnant. So it was fairly late in the game, so to speak. And it, it, it took some convincing from his secretary of all people to finally go and do something after she showed up at his office multiple times trying to get him to step in. The the secretary who, who desperately wanted her life to be the other person's life? Yes. <laughs> who, who took another job working as a seamstress in the exact same... Uh, exact same workplace. Yeah, who who talked about how terrible Shuichi was and then continued to make her appearance as appealing as possible so as, you know, to try and attract him to her for some reason. Yeah. No, exactly. In the same way that Shingo is very much a, trying to justify himself settling for second place kind of guy, you have Aiko, the secretary, who in a weird way is also trying to put herself in the spot of settling for second place as well. Yeah, no, I, I think I think Shingo is, is obviously fairly despicable and, and plagued by plagued by uh just failure at all levels. But I think there's something to be said for him flailing and maybe not having the emotional equipment to know that he should have tried harder or to have tried in a different way, or you know, he's always just blaming essentially the hand that he's been given and it's just sort of a, a late effort is kind of the impression I get. And I, I think that's, I think that might be a lot of what Kawabata is trying to argue is just, you know, essentially this lesson of, of don't let this become you, you know, you only have one life. And a lot of these decisions that we make take a really long time to show up. Like you don't know when you arrange your, your child's marriage, who, who that person is going to be, you know, you don't know when you, you yourself get married, who that person you've married is going to be in 30 years. And I think, I think this is like a warning from Kawabata in the form of a just a really apathetic sort of struggle of of a novel to, you know, always be owning that yourself. Otherwise, look at this example of what could happen. Yeah. Let, I, I want to stick on this idea for a little bit because one theme that I was looking for in this novel and I expected in this novel and I wasn't quite sure if I found it was this idea of uh, the transition of culture. You know, this was written shortly post World War II. Um, there are some maybe maybe that plays a more major role in the background, and we can talk about that too. But there's also this generational gap, and I expected it to be very much about you know the changing values um, and how you know the traditional way had society was stronger and people had it together, and look at the children and they don't have values anymore. And I didn't really find that. And partly, I think, because Shingo himself is such a failure. And he didn't fail because he did anything that was distinctly un-Japanese. He's a very ordinary person. He works an ordinary business job, tries to have an ordinary family. And it fails. And so there's there's not that there's not a dichotomy between, like, the good way and the bad way. There's only kind of this mediocrity. Um, so... I'm curious what y'all think about what's what's what is Kawabata getting at there? Is he getting at anything? Is he was I wrong to expect to see um, this sort of generational morality t uh, tale? Yeah, I, I think I was also expecting that, and that's very much a theme that is sold in other major works by Kawabata. You know, specifically Thousand Cranes. I, f I feel like that's exactly what it is: the transition from from traditional to modern and, and what you lose in between. I, I feel like this, which was written later, and we can get into how much it may or may not mirror uh, Kawabata's own life, but I feel like this is sort of arguing that maybe before wasn't that great and maybe now isn't that great either, and they're not great in different ways, but that you know there wasn't necessarily this ideal thing that we lost and now we're in this pile of shit. It's just that, you know, they can both potentially be piles of shit. And when you look back at it from a long life of, you know, either inaction or just slow, small failures, 
that, you know, maybe, maybe there wasn't something that was so beautiful that we lost. It's just always been a struggle. Yeah. I, I think that reading sort of rests on the idea of seeing Shingo as sort of a generational everyman. And that that's where I think it, that sort of reading is problematic because Shingo is such a loser that it's hard to tell if this is a critique of the idea that the past generation did have something better or if it's just a character study of this sort of defeated old man drifting into death. That's to me where it's tricky to really know one way or the other because everything is filtered through Shingo. It's hard to get a grasp of what, if anything, he's saying about larger culture other than the culture of post-war life and how that is affecting people. Yeah, and I think that's that's something that I struggle with is who, how to read Shingo from a post-war Japanese perspective. Like, is he an everyman or is he particularly... One man. A particular... Yeah, particularly one man failure. Um, is he sort of this comic old man? Because I I found him kind of funny, too. Like, how hopeless he was. Yeah. It All this tragedy is happening around him, and he's just, like, comically fumbling through it, so clueless about how to make any positive change. Or really much desire to make positive change. I think... Yeah, he's just like, just, just let me... I, I'd rather just listen to the sound of the mountain and die. Can't things just just chill out so I can just coast into death and get buried. And I think that sort of goes towards the, what I think is something worth discussing, which is how, how much nature imagery, nature description, how much Shingo is obsessed with observing nature takes part in maybe getting an idea of what it is he's looking for, what it is he's, he is as a character. Yeah, there's definitely, definitely a cycle of, of nature references throughout the novel that that to me actually might contain more of a definitive arc than than the plot and action of the novel itself. You know, it starts out there's references to uh to the sunflowers which Shingo then identifies with. Uh there's references later to, you know, ginkgo always sprouting and there's a scene where uh where a child removes the sprouts of of the ginkgo that that Shingo had left so it's sort of it's sort of killing this thing before it had a chance. And then later there's his fascination with this thousands of years old uh, lotus seed that still has the possibility to sprout. And I kind of read that as, you know, almost sort of a jealousy thing. And then uh, later as, as the novel closes, there's a reference to uh, Kukuko's uh, heavy sagging gourds, which in itself is sort of a very suggestive statement. Um, but it is after she's had an abortion and her and Shuichi are, have sort of come back together and there's sort of a very strong fertility hint. So it, it's almost sort of commenting on this big cycle that's already in motion by nature itself. And, and you know, us as humans are sort of just a pawn. And, you know, if you fight that, you're, you know, it's it's impossible to move these things that are already in motion. Yes. And I think that gets to maybe some idea of of Shingo's mentality of, of non-action right is he he observes this sort of strength in nature that just pushes through these cycles and maybe as a way to if you want to justify him or maybe as him justifying his own behavior maybe his inaction is the natural course running itself out and so why get involved that's just i don't know it just popped into my head but that's an interesting that's an interesting perspective that's yeah that shines a whole different light on shingo like that this is somehow philosophically purposeful what he's doing <laughs> or not doing uh i don't know if it is i read the nature but, yeah. i th I think it's a very valid interpretation i mean it's, i'm gonna have to like sit with that for a little bit uh because i read i read his his relationship to nature much more cynically than the two of you did i think in that i i found it pretty sad because he obviously had a very strong connection with nature but he judged himself constantly for it and and there were there were times like when he talks about the sunflowers and he says they seem to be seem to me to be male but I don't know if they actually are, and that he he looked at these things but he didn't get close enough to understand anything, and he 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 mentions several times um, the dwarf trees which I I assume are bonsai trees, um, 
the admiration that he has for other people who care for these trees, but he has no idea how to care for them. And doesn't even want to try. He didn't he didn't cultivate the side of himself that he was that he was actually interested in, and he lived this life in business that he doesn't seem to have any interest in. So maybe maybe there is something there then with him observing nature, and maybe he does understand himself better than we could, because there is a sort of quiet of acceptance of his own life as a failure when he admits that he's just an ordinary man living a mediocre life. Yeah, and there you go. And that's the comment on modernization and westernization of sort of wasting away a life underneath fluorescent lights in, in office culture when he's really truly in love with, with the natural capabilities that, that in theory existed in the past. Now, wait, whether or not that's true, who knows? But I think that might be how all that ties back in. Well, that's a subtle comment. <laughs> I do feel like, I feel like there's a lot of power underneath this novel that I'm like trying to let it settle so that it can rise up. And I feel like maybe that's, that's part of it. It's like this relationship what this relationship with nature means. Well, it feels like each scene of natural description is a metaphor for something that is never fully realized, or at least I'm having a hard time realizing what each one is, and sometimes they seem to clash with each other. And I think that's part of the difficulty of the book, for me anyway, was that there are these scenes that I feel like are incredibly representative of something that I don't fully understand. Yeah, like if you take the sunflowers, which are there for the one season, and then, you know, as we sort of said earlier, Shing Shingo identifies with them, but the next season they've been replaced. Yeah. And I think that is just like poetically perfect, right? Like you you get your season, and then the next time around it's going to be something different. <laughs> uh, another natural scene that I liked was he when he's on the train every day, he wa he sees those two, I guess, I think they're pine yeah, trees maybe? Yeah, two pine trees. And they're kind of growing, they're separate but they appear to be growing towards each other but they never touch and then one day he realizes that those trees aren't actually in the forest they're like off on their own and then and then he doesn't pick it up again but well that's it right there is that things are never really picked up they just kind of and th this is kind of goes towards this idea of how time works in this novel things just sort of bleed into each other and pass so casually like all of a sudden we're in a new season all of a sudden something is mentioned that happened two weeks ago. Ideas are really never carried through, and I think part of that is Shingo's own memory loss, which we didn't really discuss yet, which is a big part of the novel, where the, he can't really remember things properly and he can't hold on to things. But I think that's one of the difficulties, is maybe those metaphors are never fully flushed out because Shingo himself can't carry the thought through. Yeah, and I think that's that's very much Kawabata rolling in potentially some of his own experiences, but also sort of filling out the narrative such that it lines up with uh, what Shingo is going through. Yeah. And what I mean by that is just that, you know, you said the memory loss, which uh, I, I think shows up. My favorite is when he repeats things. And by he, you know, sometimes that's that's Kawabata, sometimes that's Shingo, but you just feel this thing and it's, it's not really directly referred to, but it's almost when you when you hit it, you're like, man, I really thought that he already covered this. And you just see that like it's cycling, he's using it as a different way to express this this aging and, and loss of memory. And then just these little moments that are like really two thirds of the way there from just being a specific, easy to understand metaphor or representation of something. And then it just sort of fades away real quickly and moves on to the next thing. And I think the way that's written is to really follow that aging narrative. And uh, I don't know, it's one of my favorite parts. Interesting. I, I... I noticed the repetition, but didn't it occur to me that that was representative of his own thought process? Yeah, or maybe just nobody edited this. Who knows? No, nah, I, <laughs> I, I got what you get out of it, Nick. I, th I think it's very much Kawabata placing the narrative structure around his protagonist. So let's talk about the, the autobiographical stuff. So we've, we've read on the previous uh, episode some fairly early... Uh, I think starting with 1920s short stories uh, and then a couple stories that, you know, bridge the gap uh, beyond the sound of the mountain. Um, but we knew as starting out as a young man, Kawabata to me still always felt like an old man at heart. But when I read this, I didn't realize how, how much to that extent that could happen as he aged. 
And so I have a hard time trying to figure out what the line is in between Shingo and Kawabata. And, you know, there's stuff in here where he he intersperses uh, summaries of uh, all of his friends and acquaintances' funerals. And that's just this recurring episode throughout the novel. And each time it happens, it sort of just like raises the level one more. And it continually ri- reminds him of, of aging and death a little bit more and a little bit harder. And so I'm trying to figure out how much of that is just the character of Shingo or how much of that is Kawabata himself. Well, I think it, I believe it was at Kawabata's own funeral when another author gave Kawabata the nickname the Master of Funerals. And I know we, we talked <laughs> a little bit about this um, in one of the stories we discussed in the last episode, which was the first one. I can't remember the title off the top of my head. A Warm, Sunny Place or something like that? Yeah, that was it. Okay. Um, where there's this young boy living with his grandfather because his parents have died and his grandmother died and all the, his siblings were dead. Uh, that is actually Kawabata's life. Like, by the time he was 10, most of his family was dead. And a lot of people around him died, and suicide was a a big part of of his life as well. There were there were other authors, there were other artists that that committed suicide, and so I, th- I think that title seems to fit Kawabata, and certainly seems to fit Shingo, because throughout the novel there are those little just these little stories where oh, all of a sudden he's got he has a card in the mail, or he's got to send flowers, or he runs into somebody. And there's just an endless line of of people he knows that are are dead or dying. So it's it's hard for me not to see Kawabata in Shingo a little bit as as a man who's sort of prepared for his own death and has probably been prepared for quite some time. And also as a man that is obsessed with puppies. By the way, <laughs> apparently that was a huge thing. There there was a short story in uh, Palm of the Hand stories uh, about. Uh, breeding dogs, and so when the 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 character we'll go with character of Teru shows up, the uh, sort of neighborhood dog that chooses his house to have uh, his his offspring, or rather her offspring. I just that to me is is also Kawabata just bleeding right through. It's like oh, you also managed to sneak in your your love of dogs into this. That's, that's fantastic. <laughs> um, Shingo was in the book. He's how old? Sixty two. In his 60s, I don't know the specific. We'll go with 62. Sure. Um, So Kawabata was uh, 55 when it was published. So he was projecting a little bit. If this, if you know, if it if it does have an autobiographical slant, he's projecting a little bit. But even 62 seemed to me kind of surprisingly young to be so obsessed with death. Well, isn't there also sort of a just a realistic time component? I mean, 62 in the 50s. Yeah, what is that like eighty now? That's the new black. But but in reality, like I, I when you read that throughout literature, I always find myself smiling a little bit when people talk about aging. And if you go back to like the you know a, a novel written around the nineteen hundreds that refers to a woman of of age thirty as just like old and past, and I'm like, man, that's just when it starts. Uh, so like I th- I think that yeah, age sixty. When you think about technology and nutrition and medical care and stuff in in the fifties is is probably pretty old, whereas now you know you still have plenty of life left. So I think there's a chunk that's associated there. Um, did he, did Shingo other than his his memory lapses? Um, he seemed to be in pretty good health, right? Compared to his friends who, you know, yeah. I mean, he, he were falling like flies. Not only did he forget memories, but he would forget how to do things. There was the famous scene of him forgetting how to tie his tie. And he would sort of misplace memories or rearrange things. And I think, you know, the opening scene where he hears the sound of the mountain and there's that, that, that hint that hearing the mountain means that someone's going to die. I think maybe there is a, a part of Shingo, the character, that wants to die. Or at least is ready to, even if he might not physically be close to death. Yeah, I kind of got the sense that he wanted to die. I mean, there was that one quote where, uh, I don't remember where it was, but he's talking about how nice it would be to be buried. Yes, he constantly makes references to how tired he is, and how it would be nice to like take his head into a shop to get cleaned, and then... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Then also, yeah, be buried like one of the lotus seeds for 30,000 years. 
but he makes it clear not to die, just to take a rest for like 30,000 years yeah. so that he can wake up and have all of his problems be dead. Gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think he's looking around at everybody who's experiencing their own declining health and everyone's own fall from grace. And there's a chunk of him that simply just doesn't want that. And I think that goes back to the topics of suicide. Uh, you know, there's always there's stories that, that get filtered in and there's the one story of of the man pulling out every single individual gray hair until he has no more gray hairs. <laughs> and then, you know, the closing quote of that is, no one seems to know whether he started pulling it out because he lost his mind or he lost his mind because he pulled out too much. Yeah. And so it's just this constant, like, flow of, of details of, of what it means to age, you know, less than gracefully. And I think he doesn't want that because he's already, he's already arrived at this point that isn't so great and it's probably just going to get worse. And so he's aware and he's just tiring him out every single day. And he just, a chunk of him just wants it to be over. So he doesn't have to deal with these problems anymore. Yeah. I would say that Kawabata really conveys aging well, at least in this perspective. Like I, I, even halfway through the book, I got a really strong sense of like, man, getting old sucks. <laughs> there were, there were parts of it where I was reading it and I was like, man, I feel old now after reading this. <laughs> Yeah, what is like so when you guys think about the flow of this, I think I really liked my struggle with the tone of it. And what I mean by that is when I read a lot of books, I often find myself, you know, either rooting for a character or rooting for how terrible they are or just at least being into the prose and all that. Whereas this one actually was very much a struggle for me because at no point, I mean, I certainly didn't like Shingo, but to me he actually was not so terribly despicable that it became a little bit of a pleasure he was just sort of this entity with failed attempts at things it was trying a little bit but not that much and the tone while very beautiful in prose um you know still just painted this thing in just the million just different shades of gray and black and everything in between and that took a bit of a struggle to get through, which is kind of the first time that I think I've had such a hard time getting through a book that is comparably pretty short and pretty easy on the prose from a, from a straightforward manner. So like, how did you guys deal with the tone of that? Well, I, I read it in such a short amount of time that it never, there was, there was never much of like a, a struggle over time. There was a bit of an internal one early on because one of the first things you read about Shingo is how he treats his wife when she snores. So that sets him up as a bit of a, a douchebag. Um, <laughs> but in terms of like tonally, in terms of like comedy or metaphor or what the book is trying to do, that the struggle there, I, I agree with, and I, I've already mentioned it. And I kind of enjoyed it because I, I was constantly trying to figure out parts of the book and what it was, what it was trying to say about aging what it was trying to say about post-war culture, what it was trying to do. And it felt like it was it was sort of introducing me to a question, but not answering it. And I I, I enjoyed that struggle. So for me, I, I found it pleasurable to wrestle with those ideas. For me, it, it wasn't so much of a struggle. Like I actually, I mean, I, I read through it really quickly, mostly just as a matter of necessity. Um, but especially, I think halfway through the book, I enjoyed quite a lot because I was waiting to see Shingo grow or how this was going to develop. And it was halfway through that I realized that it wasn't and he wasn't going to do anything. And then I kind of resented him, but I found the the way that Kawabata paced the book with these between sections, pretty massive periods of time would pass. Then to kind of like focus on this short period of time, then a massive period of time would pass to move things along pretty, pretty quickly. So I didn't feel like I was stuck in this, uh, you know, in this drudgery of this man's life. Um, and then the the humor that was interjected, I enjoyed, and um, yeah, and I enjoyed his just his prose in general. But things are never really resolved. I think that like it does jump in time and it jumps to these little episodes, but nothing ever feels resolved. And you said you kept waiting for Shingo to sort of change or realize something i kept waiting for him to die <laughs> <laughs> and not because i didn't like the narrative i just because i think the way that it started and it made it feel so inevitable 
Yeah. And time just kept going. And all of a sudden it was this season, this season. And we were like a year later. I was like, I'm pretty sure this novel set it up with him thinking he was going to die like soon. And yet he's just still going through the same pattern of existence. It's kind of like the um, Lost, the TV show, where it just introduces new things but doesn't resolve anything. <laughs> and it keeps you going. For, you're like, all right, well, I'll just read the next section. And you're like, oh, that didn't answer it. Well, it's, it must be answered in the next section. And then before you know it, it's over. Oh, yeah. And I think that gets it. It's sort of a strange sort of realism in life. He goes to see his his son's woman, as she's referred. I can't remember her name. We just, you mentioned it earlier. Uh, Kinu. Yeah. And uh, that idea of this bastard, as it's referred to, being out in the world sort of troubles him. But he's never going to know what happens there. And so that, that storyline just kind of vanishes into a repetition of memory until it's no longer mentioned. Yeah, and he's even okay with not knowing because he feels that he's seen scenarios much worse than that, right? He was fighting in the war and seeing his friends and and comrades just, just killed right next to him. So he's Shui like, Chi, oh, having, talking about. Yeah, yeah. Like having a bastard child out there, not that big a deal. Seen worse. Yeah. Well, he's also like, he's like, she said it's not mine, so that's good enough for me. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, I, I'll, I'll take that. Yeah, I liked, I liked, David, your quote about you know, setting up the questions and then not answering them. And then suddenly you're, you're just further along and it's already just into a different scenario. And, and it just, it keeps sliding out and it keeps, keeps elongating and and just moving on. And I think that's the thing that after I finished this book, I realized that I'd been thinking about it a lot more than most books I've read because of that theme and because of that tone that it has. So while I was never just super stoked to be reading it at the time. I think I've thought about it far more than a lot of other stuff because of the way it, it's just kind of that realistic, not everything is as connected as, as a nice, snappy, uh, fully resolved novel may have you believe. It's actually yeah. just a string of kind of connected, but mostly unconnected events that Maybe you forget some, maybe you repeat yourself and, you know, it's five years later and you're just doing the same shit. And I like love that, that expression of that feeling in a way that really just sort of buried itself in me and, and came out in small chunks as I thought about it later. I feel like, uh, and maybe this is just me looking for something, but it's not, it, it doesn't seem to me to be just that, but like underneath that, there's like these hidden symbols that are offering more definitive answers. Right, one that, that I'd like to talk about that we just kind of uh, mentioned. So Shuichi has two children in the, or conceives two women in whatever conceives, whatever, <laughs> there's two children in the process of being born in the book. <laughs> um, one to his wife and one to his mistress. And his wife is, I think, a, pretty uh outstanding model of traditional japanese wifedom and her child is she aborts her child and his mistress refuses to and his his, his mistress is um, a war widow shuichi is sort of this you know he says psychological trauma from the war and it seems pretty powerful that it's that child that can make it in this world and the child with the traditional woman can't or I, it doesn't but I, I apply to that this idea of this child can't make it and to me there's something pretty he's saying something pretty potent in that yeah i think in there is a little bit of you know maybe things seem less perfect uh now than they potentially did in in a traditional world but this is the stuff that we need to do in order to get through in a less perfect world you know i also sort of tie it back to you know, traditional Japanese households and even just traditional Western households, you know, a hundred years ago, however far back, um, you know, very gender role heavy, um, not a lot of communication, not a lot of equality whatsoever. And so this, to me, felt like a little bit of a purgatory where, you know, having a mistress and children out of wedlock and, and stuff like that. But you're right, that's the one that succeeds. The one that uh, was in the traditional marriage and traditional household, you know, st- didn't fit the bill because it wasn't perfect enough. Whereas this other imperfect scenario, an imperfect child, 
is the one that's going to move forward in the imperfect world. So I think there is indeed something in there. Yeah. And, and you get the sense that, and it's even referenced to that the, uh, the woman of the affair, um, Kinu is the stronger woman because she's been through all of this and because she can determine her future. Whereas Kikuko really has no control over what happens in her life. Yeah. Where do you think that the, or do you think that there's a judgment on the part of either Shingo or Kawabata in terms of, um, between these two women? I don't, I don't know if there is much like explicit judgment. It's more just like, even Shingo doesn't seem to very, I mean, he somewhat judges Kinu, but I think his judgment of her is more a judgment of his son. So what we're given as a reader is just sort of shown to us. And I, I think... I kind of got the sense that he was, I don't know what the word, impressed that she went off and started her own business. That he had some reverence to her sort of will to continue that maybe he envied. Yeah, Shingu, Shingu does think about it. He thinks about this woman going off and having a child and, and starting her own business. Yeah. Yeah, but isn't in a... I, I would think of it a little bit different as... I felt Shingo was more attracted to Kikuko, and then Shuichi was more attracted to Kinu, and Shingo was attracted to the more traditional, idyllic path, whereas Shuichi, who had sort of been through his terrible experiences in the war, wanted somebody that was sort of equally war-torn, and that was why he was more attracted to his mistress rather than his you know, more traditional, idyllic wife. Yeah, that's very true. But I, but I still think there is that a sense of respect towards her. Is there in that dynamic? I get this sense that there's there's a well a feeling that that Japan is broken. It just you know the the broken people who would be Shuichi and Kinu, uh, like they they were they were psychologically damaged by the war more than any of the other characters. But they need each other, and they're kind of the ones with the most will to live. Then what does that say about Shuichi, the who sort of falls back in line with with what the family wants by the end of the novel? But does he? But I because Kikuku in the last chapter, I think she says she she comes out to Shingo and she says, you know, sometimes Shuichi does things that terrify me. Yeah, he's he's a very violent person. So there's the the novel ends with the appearance of him returning to the family, but. More than that, Kinu left him, I think. And and Kikuko, you know, there's that that violent image of, of the the ear that got torn off. And I, don't, I can't remember if Shingo says it to her or if he just thinks it. But it, he's he's thinking if Kikuko will just stick to Shuichi like... Like a bloody um, ear. Like a bloody ear that's been cut off and reattached, then maybe eventually things will return to normal. Yeah, and I, so I kind of want to ask this question about, you know, whether post-war Japan was a broken Japan. And I want to relate this back to another post-war novel that we just read, Henderson the Rain King. So you have two different societies' response to uh, the massive tragedies of World War II. And you have two totally different characters. You have in, have in Henderson a, a boisterous just loud mouth, somewhat comical guy who's willing to go to the extremes and is also failing the entire time, um, but somehow has this just positive, endless, go for it attitude. And then on the other side, you have Shingo, who uh, also m marred by failure, uh, just sort of wants it all to be over. So I found it awesome that we sort of read these <laughs> perfect post-war post, post -war novels with these characters that are just amplified versions of, of realities in each society. And we read them so close back to back that they simultaneously share absolutely nothing, but yet everything. I mean, we really plan these things out. <laughs> yeah. And, and they reflect the sort of the idea of the culture after the war too. I mean, in Henderson, you have this sense of, of someone who has been through something terrible. And yet there is this idea of redemption. And in Shingo, there is this sort of shrug shoulder of defeatism that I think, I mean, it certainly plagued post-war Japan for a long time. 
at least parts of the culture, definitely internally. And not only, not only is it, are these, you know, are they coming from two very different cultures where the, you know, the culture response to the same thing would be very different, but Japan lost the war and they were subjected to, you know, great humiliation. You know, there's a sense of defeat just having been to a war and seeing people die and going through that trauma. And what, how is that amplified when, you know, you not only lose the war, but your culture is demanded to change. Yeah, exactly. Henderson's looking for meaning amongst a society of consumerism and, you know, f success after this victory, whereas uh, Shingo is looking for any slice of meaning after a massive failure that is then followed by his own continual failure that is then followed by the continued failure of his children. And uh, it's just, you're right, it's it's just stacked on top of each other, and they end up in such totally different categories. And the only place Shingo can look for for that story is in nature. He can't look at his family around him, which is, I think is part of why all that nature focus is there, because where else can he turn to find something? All the stories he tells about his life, about his friends, about the culture, they're all pretty terrible. All the newspaper stories everything it's the only positive aspects are in the natural world yeah and the more we talk about this the more i kind of would go back to an early comment i made about how he is trying at some level he's trying to put some things in action he's trying to correct things maybe he's late maybe it's apathetic but the hand that he has just based on societies in and uh recent history and uh, everyone's mentality around him is such a suffocating uh, reality is just it's it's too much. I wonder I wonder if anyone could have made through it made it through that, or if you know is it Shingo's fault himself, or could nobody have bust their way through all of those problems that were just stacked against him? And that's that's why I wonder if maybe the the overarching message is this Japan is broken kind of message, not more so than. Um, Shingo being an individual failure or the past being better than the future, but just that, just this current state of purgatory. Yeah. And I wonder if we, as you know, Americans, Westerners, whatever, sort of look for that individuality message. And that's the thing that we extract from this narrative. Whereas you're right. Maybe the purpose of the narrative is as a whole, you know, more traditional Japanese hierarchical structure, uh, you know, where do you fit in? Where's your place? And I wonder if we're, you know, again, everyone reads a novel and looks for things that they identify with. Are we just pre-tuned to identify with that individuality aspect and this greater thing is actually right in front of us? And, you know, we're talking about it now, but it, it seems like it wasn't the initial thing that we were drawn to about the novel itself. So I think that's pretty cool to see that there's two sides of this coin that Kawabata has laid out. And maybe maybe he intended it and maybe he didn't. Maybe it's a social interpretation thing. But um, I don't know. I like slicing that different ways. Yeah. I mean, for such a simple novel, there's a lot to get into. I think I think part of it is the way that he wrote it where things don't wrap up. So, I mean, we haven't even talked about half of the characters. And I feel like each one of them has their own has a pretty their own pretty complicated set of circumstances that are less likely to be ex, uh, explicitly described than sort of implied but even like the secretary like we talked about that a little bit like she had she's a she's she's a pretty minor character but she's a pretty complete character too you get a pretty strong sense of her own psychological dilemmas the wife i actually liked uh, shingo's wife quite a lot she was maybe my favorite character and she she dealt with things with she's just she's she seems much stronger than Shingo. Like she's she was dealt the same hand, maybe worse, because she was a woman and she was married to Shingo. But she she kind of approaches things with a very practical wisdom and a wry sense of humor. Yeah, she's she, not she's not trying to. She knows what she needs to do and she does it. And I think she doesn't like Shingo because he doesn't do the things he knows he needs to do. She seems very pragmatic and almost kind of like a a bad '90s sitcom mom who she's she, she's the one that really runs things in the house you know yeah totally <laughs> exactly yeah do you think shingo though mistakes pragmatism for simplicity and that's one of the reasons why he kind of looks down upon her i think she's ugly yeah that's why he does that's why he doesn't like her he's a superficial jerk but she knows that she's ugly and she's like whatever 
<laughs> she's not trying to pretend or she's not she's not upset that she's ugly she's not trying to pretend that she's not she's just like this is the hand that i was dealt and so let's get on with life yeah that was a definitely a point for me of trying to separate kawabata from shingo uh, because every female character is either categorized as attractive or, or not attractive and then their their worth is essentially determined from that and I, I think if you read it more, you can you can figure out their real worth, aka you know your point about his wife really leading the household and being being one of the non despicable characters within the book. But yeah, it was a little little tough for me trying to figure out from a generational standpoint, written in the fifties and then Japanese culture, um, you know, just all of these blatant just references to beauty and not beauty and, and tying that back into your place in society. I was kind of like, ah, it's you know. That's the thing that didn't age super well, but but maybe it is also meant to be the veneer there that you have to break through to to find the real worth. So I have a question for you guys. So we've talked a lot about just how kind of dark and maybe unmoving and just extended disappointments in time that this novel focuses on. But I actually read the ending as a little bit positive, sort of references to... Um, Kukuko after her abortion with the the nature part of the gourds and the tie-in to fertility. And I really saw that as just a slight tick up at the end back into uh, positive progress. And so I, I came away with the novel, even though it was a bit of a, a, bit of a uh, sludge to get through, um, that the end had a, had a path, really. And so I was curious if you guys found that same thing. See, I've, I found the ending to be that that's sort of negative, but positive in the fact that the way Shingu reads nature is cyclical and life is cyclical. So in the end, when he mentions the gourds, he even calls out to Kikuko, but the last line is, she apparently could not hear him over the sound of the dishes, kind of as representative of his own voice not being as important to the family anymore almost like like he really is fading away and that whatever whatever continuation of this family that he's created will continue on without him and so there is i guess there is that sort of metaphorical death there and maybe i'm reading way too much into it but i, I found that line and because usually i look into last lines and i try to find what why would you end the book here and it seems almost very throwaway as a line. But then when I, I began to think about it, I, I read it as his voice not being heard and not being important because his generation and his life is going away and the cycle is going to continue. Yeah, I like that interpretation. It's somebody else's time. Yours is over. Just fade out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty perfect. It's, it's, so, it's so pathetic. Yeah. It's like it's not drowned out by roaring or waterfalls or you know gunfire. It's drowned out by the sound of dishwashing. Exactly. It's not. It's not the sound of the mountain. It's the sound of monotonous chores that that provide yeah. the the next path to the next cycle. <laughs> yeah. It stays domestic, he, always. Uh, I wanted to add to this though that you know in terms of the uptick at the end, I'm I'm pretty cynical about Kikuko's and. Chuichi's relationship that this is actually on the mend. I think he hopes it is, but he's proven himself to be pretty unreliable. But the daughter of Fusako, I think, is taking meaningful steps forward. Because right before that scene, she's asking for money to start her own business and she's, you know, stepping out on her own, absent her um, divorced husband and actually making a, a change. And she's the only character who actually steps out and makes a change. And Kikuko kind of steps out of her character to defend Fusako's desire and to say that yes, of course she can. She can do this thing. Mm -hmm. So these these two women characters who have been, you know, the most their will has been suppressed the most throughout the book. In the very end, are the ones who step up and say like, "We can change," and no one else says that. Yeah, yeah. and and even at the very end, Shingo, I think comments like are you even capable of starting your own sake bar yeah and then yeah that's that's when kukuko comes to her side so yeah it's like he's even as he's fading away he's still trying to hold on to to control this thing when in reality you should have let go of it a long time ago <laughs> <laughs> 
Thanks for listening. I hope you uh, enjoyed us talking about Kawabata's Sound of the Mountain. Uh, we'll be announcing their next book selection and podcast soon. So follow us on Twitter at Bookso Substance. Check us out on Facebook um, and to learn what... Fuck, just to you know, see what's coming up. And check us out on Facebook to keep up and to keep... Fuck! Dude, you're so to... close. <laughs> <laughs> to stalk our happenings to uh y- listen to our tweets to hear our <laughs> inner thoughts to waste your life whatever just do it <laughs> yeah uh you can also check us out online at booksofsomesubstance.com where you can sign up to receive some badass artwork and read over some very cool typewritten introductions to the books themselves When you read that a young person has been killed or committed suicide, you just say to yourself, it's happened again, mused Yusako. But with old people, it really hits you. People should go away while they are still loved. I love you guys.